And I just think it makes perfect sense that we're starting out this entire summit with the education and learning sector because education, as you know, Karan, is foundational. Well, I, I went to the design college, I graduated and I started my design firm because I didn't have to have any kind of reference point of, you know, school or education. Everything was a canvas, you know, to start with. And my kids, and I'm talking about very young, so they were my children, my oldest was six years old, right? I, I really got them to become my co-designers in, in the process. We keep thinking experts are the ones who write the theories. I swear experts are those children. How we approach learning today is inextricably linked to global progress, and it will ultimately determine the type of future we create. We are seeing that the mindset around learning is changing, how what we're anticipating about learning is changing, how we're designing the learning environments online is starting to rapidly change. The inclusion of more virtual reality, immersive technologies, all of this is starting to impact the way in which we learn. So learning really starts with purpose. And it's not just what the purpose of the learning is, it's you know, what is your purpose? You know, what are you trying to do with your life? The future of learning also requires an entrepreneurial mindset. If you are choosing your purpose to be a purpose that interacts with others, collaborates with others, and impacts change. The fourth estate provides a public check on the branches of government. What news source do you trust, Yolanda? How do you know where to go in order to make sure you're getting something that's real and accurate and not just someone's personal idea of what should be happening? Well, part of it is looking at different, you know, different stations, uh, looking at different, you know, print media, uh, looking for investigative journalism, for example, that, you know, extends the story out broader, more broadly than you might see in local newspapers. I would say this notion of the dawning of the age of Aquarius or a shift has been pernicious because it's produced a lot of thinking and a lot of, of wishful or hopeful thinking. So we can create a, a, a vision for the future that's, that's desirable. And then we can also encourage people towards taking actions that would produce that future. So one of the things that's, that's really important to know about being a storyteller is that we are both part of the cultural narrative and a and a causative agent on the cultural narrative there, there are numerous numerous studies that validate the fact that sound has incredible power on the brain and those healing properties to that power that now therapists music therapists and scientists can use now of course that sound is being used widely now to help people recover from strokes, from neurological traumas. Sound is being used to help Alzheimer, dementia uh, patients. Sound is being used by psychologists and therapists to help people get over anxieties, depression. Um, uh, it even used to uh, boost immunity system, where immunity system is related to uh, issues of stress. Consciousness is a cosmic force, and our, our consciousness is uh, really the primary medium of every artist, but of every person. And uh, consciousness itself is inherently creative. Uh, and we've started to regard, you know, art as a sacred path or uh, a spiritual path. You know, so what if uh, creativity itself was the religion? And each religion was kind of an expression of this cosmic creative force, you know, that runs through everyone. We have seen and understand that when you're dealing with a systems level problem and plastics has been built as a whole ecosystem that is developed to optimize efficiency and price. When you're dealing with that system, you have to basically get out of the system and rebuild it to bring innovation into the system. 
And frankly, the industry was very focused on regenerative agriculture, food waste reduction, renewable energy, um, many, many environmental solutions. But what about the human side? It's about proving human uniqueness through making connections with people that you know and trust. And uh, it puts the power back into our hands. We, we take control of our own identities. We don't abdicate that power to, um, to an organization that didn't ask our permission. Instead, we give that power to the people that we know and trust, and they're the guardians of our identity. And if we could get control of the system for the public, it could be a good thing. We could set up our own public banks that issue money directly into the economy, expand the money supply, get things moving, act as a stimulus for the local economy. Money solves the problem. And it's been done historically where the government just issues the money. But the problem is that our government tends to either think this would be inflationary, but it actually wouldn't, depending on where you put the money. If you see where we are today, what we find is, is that societies at a scale, cooperative societies at a scale that would have been unimaginable to our ancestors. And so a scale of cooperation that, uh, that uh, would be unimaginable in the past, and yet we need to go higher. There's a final rung of global cooperation. And from this long view, it seems as if we have just one more step to go. That final rung, if we know how to do it, is within, within uh, reach. There is this mismatch between global problems and non-global solutions. The only way I believe that we can do that is by building an inclusive global social movement, a constituency that is demanding a relevant seat at the table for our common interests as humans sharing the same planet. The only way that our world is going to change is with systemic change. We need global democracy, uh, a government that represents people, not concentrations of wealth, not sovereign power centers, militarized patterns, power centers, but people themselves. This is the key thing. No nation on earth can create peace. Nations are not equipped to deal with planetary problems. And neither is the United Nations, which is just a, a treaty of sovereign nations. It really doesn't abolish the system itself. So this is what the Earth Constitution is about. Like any and all of us who are searching, um, the, one, the, the first step on the journey leads to others. 20, 30 years ago, like yoga was seen as a fringe thing. And we, now it's m m much more mainstream. It's the same thing like we hear with mindfulness. Like the, and these are even in the workplace, in the, in the corporate workplace, we hear about how mindfulness is helpful. Uh, and and it, it, it's a stress reducer and, and a stress reliever. Being a seeker, you know, my question is, um, as things become mainstream, uh, is, there, are, is there room for other modalities? Is there room for other practices? And uh, my own answer to that question is yes. People have lost control over their minds. The media is controlling the mind. Emotions are controlling the mind. Belief systems are controlling the mind. It's like we need to regain control over our mind. And also the food we eat affects our mind too. Why live foods? And the first thing about live foods, it's got the most energy. They all build that energy so that expands our consciousness. Now. How can we together overcome this climate crisis and climate emergency in solidarity so that essentially no one is left behind? Women hold the key to this process, especially in the developing nations, uh, which is the majority of, of the population of the world, uh, which is, again, the least of the culprits, but the biggest of the, uh, the victims. This is why we really, really need to look at the relationship between gender justice 
and uh, eco justice, etc. So uh, this is a crucial, crucial piece. We must learn to learn to take soil not just as a composed as a composite of minerals and rocks and other uh, water and air, but it's basically a living system like us. And so like other other ecosystem is a living system. So uh, next slide, please. And the soil is presently is very important in the context of sustainable development goals on earth. Human beings are now the primary force altering the physical, chemical and biological properties of the planet on a geological scale. That's why scientists have named this the Anthropocene Epoch. But we don't know enough to occupy this position of dominance without undermining the life support systems of Earth, the air, water, soil, sunlight, and biodiversity. I believe this relatively recent preference for left brain thinking has everything to do with our sense of things being out of balance and our wish to turn around what we see as a destructive path. That great rise in power of reductionist thinking scientific left brain thinking in the last couple of centuries has led to great scientific advances, yet simultaneously devastated our ecosystems. So thriveability is really a complete um, system that I came up with about eight years ago. And the whole crux is that we leave things better than how we found them. We put things, uh, we put back more than we take and we create abundance and health and wellness, not only for, for human beings, but for plants and animals and, and entire ecosystems. And um, the three components that, that fit into this thrivability model are social, economic, and environmental factors. Um, and then another part of thrivability is combining ancient and modern technology. The future is where nature and architecture actually blend and they actually become synergistic. So you don't know where nature stops and where building begins. And so this entire blending is where we wanna take lessons from um, natural processing, from basically landscape and the way that trees actually regulate heat and regulate air quality, and actually integrate that into a building. Sustainability is not about just uh, you know, renewable energies and how to conserve water. It really has to do with basically cultural legacy in terms of how to stabilize and how to, uh, how to stabilize and invest in a generational cultural, um, uh, cultural building you know, for communities. Slowly but surely, uh, we can build up a little AI avatar that knows our interests, our behaviors, and so forth. So eventually, it could go running around the internet while you're sound asleep, picking up things that you'd like to do, uh, some that you'd like to do just because it's cool to do it, and some you'd like to do because you would have to make some income from it because it's part of your self-actualization activity. I'm going to focus on these brain emulations. We're going to need to take individual human brains and scan them in fine spatial and chemical detail. And we can put that all together to make a computer model of a particular brain after it's hooked up with artificial eyes, ears, and hands and mouth so it can actually do things. And if you can do that and make that cheap enough, then everything changes. Think about robots and understand how they're different from humans because they can be represented by computer files. That's this key point. So next. Robots can be immortal because computer files can be immortal. Every day that we live presents sacred opportunities to express the deep core of who we are as spiritual beings in every thought, word, and deed. To be present in the world as a loving, kind, and compassionate person requires a lifelong commitment to turning the searchlight inward to do the ceaseless, fearless self-examination to see how we can change to become better persons. The future face of spirit that we can already see unfolding is this what, what is called this activism. We to make sure that we live out a religion 
in a manner that is consistent with spirituality, we have to be righteous, have compassion, recognize our interdependence, and that we are complete in the whole, not the parts, not believe in exclusive truths, use language that is inclusive of us, which includes everyone, practice rituals that are not an end in itself, commit ourselves to living in equality for all and standing up for others while we honor the holiness of everyone. We stand at an unprecedented time on our planet. One can imagine that any planet with intelligent life anywhere has had to go through this transition. And just like on our planet, they had far more embedded skills about division than about unity. And one can also imagine that also on that planet, as on ours, an uptick in consciousness was going on. An uptick that realized after all the millennia of apparent separation and difference, there was in fact a profound reality of interconnectedness underneath it all. Today we stand at a precipice, a massively complex and chaotic void that separates the passing paradigm and the new one that's struggling to be born. The person's view of the Godhead necessarily impacts his values and his behavior. For example, how can a woman ever be equal on the earth plane if God is male in the ethereal plane? The primary feature of this paradigm will be redefining the Godhead and rebalancing it with divine masculine and feminine principles that are inherent in the cosmos. That's job one. Our second job will be designing spiritual belief systems worthy of second tier minds and hearts. This is about the sense why we are here in this world, in this beautiful planet that we call Mother Earth. We believe that we came for a reason and we need to remember who we are, where we come from. So we, need, we know where to go, what to do, how to do and how to think. Some cultures, some people think about the seven generations to come, but actually it's also to acknowledge the, the ancestral wisdom and the, our ancestors that were here before us. We have gone away from the original instructions. And one of the original instructions that uh, was given us as human species is to work collectively. And we need to remember that. At this time, we as, as human beings with, with um, all that we're perceiving around us are considering coming together like we have never come before. And the first thing, the first um, energy that we need to ensure that we are, are bringing and offering is love. There is a greater source, which is somewhere out there in the universe. And if we can tap into that source, and we can allow that energy to flow through us, through meditation, through movement, and meditation in movement, through walking prayer, through whichever other activity or discipline that you have found to enable you to open those channels to continually be giving love in every single act, as small as looking into someone else's eye. So Damanur is famous uh, around the world for its underground temple. So um, what is Damanur about? Damanur is this uh, federation based on action, based on solidarity, based on positive thinking. The dream was and still is to create something new for the world, to be an example, an example, an inspiration for many of the other communities in the world. Damor has always been to demonstrate that it's possible to create a whole holistic different society than uh, the you know mainstream society that is present now. So 
We've always been at the same time reaching out to other realities and uh, trying to show to the world through journalism, television, documentaries, etc., what we were able to, to create in such a small time and with such small uh, amount of people. Our survival now depends on reconciling with Earth as healers rather than exploiters. The path ahead requires that we join as one to redirect human purpose, power, and procreation. This possible world, the possible world of our future, will not emerge spontaneously. But we can use our global communications capabilities to imagine and create it together. Creating a future of well-being for people on Earth requires that we quickly shift from an imperial civilization of domination and exploitation to an ecological civilization of partnership and mutual care. We are called to rethink and transform our institutions of government, business, education, science, religion, the arts, communications, and civil society. What humans have imagined, we humans can reimagine. This is our moment to embrace the distinctive responsibilities that come with our distinctive human capabilities. Let us now move forward to create the possible world of an ecological civilization dedicated to the well being of people and Earth and to life's continued evolutionary unfolding. Uh, what we need is a better new normal, a new normal I call partnerism. The struggle for our future is not between religion and secularism, East and West, right and left, capitalism and socialism, but between the domination elements in all our cultures and the partnership norms we urgently need. What we really also need to do at the same time is work on the long-term cultural change, which can be accelerated in our age of these incredible technologies of communication, if we are to prevent the regressions to domination that cause so much misery and destruction, we must join in the work of cultural transformation, focusing on four cornerstones of childhood, gender, economics, and narratives language. And no, none of us can do everything, but everyone can do something. And I'm counting on you to become active agents in the movement towards partnerism.